Dr. King said that a man, and I'm quoting, a man can't ride your back unless it's bent. Yes, standing up so others won't keep riding you or having someone who loves you to stand up to you are ways we all can serve God and humanity too. Because allowing someone to demean you, allowing someone to denigrate you, allowing someone to critically uh, uh, um, put negativity over your very name is not doing them any good at all. So being great as we serve others, also includes standing up and saying things like, I know that you think you're doing right, but according to the word of God, what you're doing is wrong. It's immoral. It's unethical. And I'm not going to participate in it anymore because I want the best for you. And I want what's best for me. I want a win-win situation. I want God's word and will to prevail. And this what you're doing is not in keeping with God's word, God's wisdom, and God's will. And so to serve God with excellence, my sister and brother, and to give you the best of what God has for you, I'm not going to allow you to use me like a doormat. This kind of mentality, when coupled with a love for the other, even the offender, is what it means to serve God and neighbor too. You see, the greatness that Jesus is talking about as we serve others is not about groveling around the floor with a bowed down head and deep secret resentments in our hearts or having fear larger than our souls, never raising our eyes up to anyone else's level, never saying a mumbling word, a prophetic word. Our greatness is in serving others, even in the difficult spaces and places. Our greatness is tied up and it's inextricably tied to our level of service. Now, the Jesus kind of service does at times require enduring certain levels of pain and suffering. There's no way around it. Times when it seems like people or the world system is getting over on you. And it does mean having to endure some messy, messy situation sometimes. And sometimes it means we've got to wait just like Job had to wait. As we reflect upon the first reading in our scriptures today, Job had to wait until his change came. And sometimes we've got to endure some very sticky and messy situations, some uncomfortable predicaments, and we have to wait too until our change comes. We can't change everything just by speaking out. We can't change some things that have been brewing for years. We can't change it overnight just by speaking up prophetically. No, no, no. Sometimes we've got to wait until God's plan of justice gets worked out. Now, I, I know I know some of my womenist sisters, and I'm for womenism. That's kind of a feminist take on our faith where we and they really, they speak out against and we speak out against toxic masculinity, even as it occurs in our faith tradition. So I'm for our women as sisters, but I do know that as I talk about suffering, they might not agree with me on this point because some of them say that talk about redemptive suffering is dangerous talk and leaves us open to abuse. In other words, to go around saying, I'm suffering for Jesus' sake, and some, while someone is taking advantage of you, they say too many women have had to endure that for too many years, and that's dangerous. I agree that there's a dangerous aspect to it, and there must be balance, but no matter how we slice it, there is such a thing as redemptive suffering, if you are a Christian, as we serve. And it knocks on the door of every gender, every race, every age of those who are trying to serve God in this world of shadows. Redemptive suffering is the kind of suffering God allows us to go through to help redeem a situation or help redeem a person as we serve God. 
We can deny the existence of redemptive suffering, but it is in our pathway. We can ignore it, but it's a vista that stands before us. It is part of the cross experience that we must bear. Didn't Jesus say that we must pick up our cross, follow him, bear our crosses each and every day? But let us not get it twisted. Serving in the Jesus kind of way is not synonymous with being someone's doormat or punching bag. <laughs> Uh-uh, no, because though we are supposed to turn the other cheek when darts are shot our way and people try to wound us, God didn't give us an endless supply of cheeks. <laughs> Sometimes you have to tell someone as you love them and as you serve them, listen, you starting to intentionally try to inflict pain on me Look around, look very carefully at me. I'm running out of the number of cheeks that I'm going to turn. Jesus just said, turn the other cheek. I'm not Jesus Jr. <laughs> Though we should be following the Lord. <laughs> the greatness in our service is a mindset of unselfishness. This quality of service is something that we remain conscious of with help from the Holy Spirit. As we keep Jesus Christ in view, as we study him, as we study his word, as we keep his perspective as a part of our inclusive perspective. And as we imitate the high priest of our confession and learn how to serve Jesus, we are all the better. And yet the question must be raised as we think about our great Lord, who is the greatest servant of all? Who is the greatest servant of all? We all say Jesus. But how, how did and how does Christ serve us? And how does Christ serve the world since we have to keep our eyes on Jesus according to Hebrews chapter 12 or 11? How did Christ serve us? And how can we learn from Christ to unlock our own greatness? The writer of Hebrews is trying to explain and remind the early Christians and us just how great Christ was and is and forever will be and what his agenda of service was all about. And these first century Jewish Christians, most of the first Christians were Jewish. They were of Hebrew ancestry. They needed to hear these reminders, just like some of us might need to hear these reminders today about what makes Jesus great and therefore what makes us great. Historically, the Christian faith was first made up of primarily Jewish believers with a few Samaritans, Ethiopians, and Greeks thrown in for good measure. But at the beginning, they were overwhelmingly Hebrew ethnically and culturally. At the time when our author is writing this epistle, many of these Hebraic Christians were still attending worship in the synagogues and the temples of their day, especially during the first half of the first century until the second temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD or 70 CE in Jerusalem. Until that horrible time of destruction of their central place of worship and practice of their religious and cultic practices and faith, the Jews were still following the traditions of their ancestors, even Christians. They were still keeping many aspects of the Mosaic law and sacred religious customs. Even the newly converted Jewish Christians after Jesus' death and resurrection were still worshiping in uh, their usual centers of worship, synagogues and temples. Therefore, many questions about keeping the Sabbath day and not eating, eating food sacrificed to Gentile idols and questions about circumcision were still hot theological debates in the early church. Those who had converted to Christ were finally over time beginning to distinguish between Jesus and Moses. Many had claimed Jesus as the Messiah, the resurrected Lord, one who revealed the very will, the personality and spirit of Yahweh. Moses met Yahweh in the burning bush, the great I am, I am that I am. But Jesus embodied 
the Yahweh that Moses saw revealed through the burning bush, that, that burning was in Jesus' heart, heart rather, perpetually. But some were tiring of the prospect of losing their place in their Jewish society. There were many, there were many Jewish rabbis and priests, stay with me, we're looking at a little bit of history, but we got to frame it this way. There were many leading Jewish rabbis and priests and even the high priest who aggressively denied that Jesus was the Messiah as the church was just starting to form. Eventually, many of these first Jewish Christians would be kicked out of their synagogues and temples. And as they are beginning to feel the sting of this persecution and this tension is rising, some could no longer clearly remember the benefits of following Christ. Why am I following Christ again? And my son is being turned down for jobs just because he claims to be Christian. Why am I following Christ again when after I lost my husband, husband now I'm trying to date uh, some other prospect husbands. And when I tell them I'm a Christian, they all look at me like I'm cray cray. They were wondering, Jesus, what have you done for me lately? I'm talking about the Hebrew Christians. And so the writer of Hebrews Hebrews has a dilemma on his hands. How do I remind these Hebrew believers, some of whom are leaving the faith, that Jesus is indeed the real deal? And so the writer pens this book to help encourage and strengthen those who were beginning to backslide away from their faith in Christ. Now, have you ever been persecuted because of your faith? I'm just trying to weave our context into the context of our text. Have you ever been persecuted or shunned because of your faith? Have you ever been looked at strangely or criticized and even possibly ostracized because of your faith in your great high priest that we call Jesus? You weren't invited to the best parties anymore. You weren't put on the guest list of the most exciting events among your circles of influence anymore. Folk knew that if you came to their event, once you received the little flyer, if you came, you would be coming with your eyes and ears that had been sanctified and set apart. And they didn't want your scrutiny in the place or in their space. Or they just figured, listen, we're not going to invite them because they won't fit in anymore. They'll feel uncomfortable. Because with you around, Betty Wright's soulful and seductive songs don't sound as good anymore. Or Donna Summer's song, Love Hangover, playing in the background doesn't seem to fit anymore. Or joints by Megan the Stallion or Baby Nas on the sound system no longer sound quite as good with you hovering and lurking around the party. Because they knew that really your musical forte was Donna Lawrence. It wasn't uh, Baby Nas. It was Kirk Carr. It wasn't Megan the Stallion. It was the Clark sisters and Dietrich Haddon. And so they figured, uh, we're just not going to go through the trouble. And listen, can I add a little caveat here? If your circle <laughs> still invites you to this day to these kind of social events all the time, I'm not talking about once, a, once in a while, but if they're always still on the phone, sister girl or brother man, come meet me here or there, then you might want to check out to see what kind of witness you're leaving. Why are they so comfortable inviting you to these worldly events? I mean, beyond birthday parties. Why are they so comfortable with you in their presence? Okay. Jesus had been dead and resurrected for 25 to 30 years, and some were growing tired of being shunned and persecuted. The writer, therefore, is led by the Spirit to attempt to corral these Hebrews back into the safety of God's salvation in Christ. And so he writes about the unique person of Jesus and the position that Jesus holds and has held in their salvation history. As a powerful reminder, just in case they had forgotten who buttered their bread. And the sacred hand that had fed them for so long. 
So the writer uses the symbols and stories that went back to their ancient understanding, their ancient Hebrew understanding of religion. And the writer takes that, especially those rituals and texts which related to the priesthood and the system of animal sacrifices. And he uses them to show forth the supremacy of Christ as the ultimate high priest. In fact, the author of Hebrews propounds that Jesus was the reality of all these shadows, all of these types that came before him, all of these symbols and figures, the priesthood, the animal sacrifices, all ultimately points to our great high priest whom God had chosen and appointed according to verse 5 through 10 of our text. God had appointed him. He didn't make himself high priest. And so because Jesus was the very reality of what their symbols and their practices and their traditions pointed to, the right of Hebrews was saying, listen, you can't really turn back because how are you going to leave reality to go back to that which only points to reality? And then the writer makes it clear that the greatness of Jesus was not a role that Jesus took on to glorify himself. God had given him a special pathway of service as the greatest priest of all, the ultimate high priest with the most challenging calling. In fact, the author explains, Jesus is the greatest of all of our priestly figures, all of our religious leaders. He's the greatest, he's the greatest. He's the greatest because he was appointed by God to serve at much deeper depths than any other person. Whether the others are Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Moses or Miriam or Aaron or Deborah or David or any other prophet, Elijah or Elisha, Ezekiel, Isaiah, John the Baptist, Denmark Vesey, Frederick Douglass, Jarena Lee, Harriet Tubman, Mary McLeod Bethune, all who served kind of as priests in their own right, Vernon Johns, Dr. King, Fannie Lou Hamer, and the many priestly Presbyterians who fought against the devil of racism and human enslavement, like Reverend Francis Grimke, founding member of the NAACP, or Charlotte Grimke, his wife, who was an anti-slavery activist and poet, and also a founding member of the NAACP. The Reverend Theodore Wright, the first African-American preacher to graduate from the very Presbyterian Princeton Theological Seminary. He was the first African-American preacher to graduate from that institution in 828. And he always was preaching with his preachments, Jesus and the fact that black folks have to be liberated. But Jesus is greater than all of them and all of us because as great as they serve God and as great as we serve God and humanity, Jesus did what none of us can do. He rendered a service greater than all of us and all of them greater than all of us. Verses one through five in summary says, listen, ordinarily, Every other high priest that has emerged is appointed that he might be a mediator, giving offerings and gifts on behalf of the people and making animal sacrifices for the sins of the people and for himself and for himself. The priest sacrifice, sacrifices rather and makes these animal sacrifices for himself too. The people had sinned, the priest had sinned. Offerings must be offered up, grain offerings, gold and silver offerings offered up, and most importantly, animals, bulls and goats must be sacrificed as a reminder that sin costs lives, that sin hurts, that sin destroys creation. It was not that God was bloodthirsty, but God never wanted us to forget as we looked at animals being sacrificed, that sin hurts somebody. That sin hurts creation. That sacrifices must ensue then for the forgiveness of sins. This was the service, my sisters and brothers, that the ancient priests offered. It was for the people and for themselves. But how many of you all know Jesus moved very differently? He moved differently. Jesus had no sin that needed forgiveness. Jesus did not need blood sacrifices to cover his mess because he had no mess to cover. 
So as a priest, he was different from any other priest or prophet or preacher or advocate for justice who has ever lived. He served and sacrificed purely for us, purely for you, purely for me. That's why Jesus sacrificed his very life. It wasn't that he was dying to just uh, in some way satisfy something in the very uh, dimensions of God that needed this kind of good feeling that finally I can be appeased and I, my anger can be appeased. No, he did it because he loved us. The meaning of this talk about the priesthood, I understand, is lost to us to some degree. And when we start talking about ancient things, we get real excited as we listen to the sermon. So sometimes we preachers, we just want to keep all of it practical. But now every now and then we got to realize that if we look at history, it can be practical. So we have to think about what is written in this text. You see, Calvary in the history of the Hebrews and also in the history and lore of the West Africans, the figure of the priest or high priest was greatly revered, even though they had their own faults and sins because of the role she or he played. And there were female priests in Africa played in those communities as they offered up sacrifices. Among the Hebrews and Africans, the priests were men and sometimes women chosen by God and sometimes chosen by the people too. They were chosen to be mediators between God and God's people. They were to stand in the gap between the people and God. They were those individuals who represented all of the people as the priests went to God. And likewise, the priests represented God to the entire community. They served as mediators, go-betweens, who also had to sacrifice for themselves. For them... God was pure holiness. He was unadulterated holiness and love and righteousness. And so God could not be approached on our own merits. God was not just a man upstairs. How do you think about God? How do you talk about God? Is God just some casual person that you can listen to or not listen to? God was not just the man upstairs. God was not just some genie in our bottles that if I say a certain prayer and attach Jesus' name at the end of it, I'm going to get everything that I want. God is not just some Joe Blow that we know out on the corner. And so it was thought in the Hebrew and African mind and imagination through God's revelatory acts that people could not just approach God willy-nilly and relate to God or interface with God on their own merits and according to their own terms because we sin. Oh, we sin. We cheat. We lie. We plot the downfall of others. Oh, I can't get no help here, but I'm telling the truth. We become envious. We, we become deceptive. But despite this, God desires to be in relationship with us. God desires to heal the breach. So God chose mediators, the priests, the priests. Thank God for the priests. Thank God for the priests. They were engaged in messy work as they killed these animals and sprinkled them over the altar and on the mercy seat. Aaron is probably the most famous of all of the priests and his descendants made up the Aaronic priesthood for century after century, generation after generation, generation rather. You could not serve in this role as mediator unless you could point to Aaron as your daddy or as your granddaddy or as your great, great, great granddaddy or as your great, great, great uncle. You had to flow through the lineage of Aaron. And as they offered up the people's offerings to God, and as they sacrificed set apart animals for the sins of the people, these acts are what ushered in the reconciliation between God and God's people because sin costs. Sin hurts. Sin hurts, my sisters and brothers. Sin hurts. Whenever the people would break the laws of God, whenever the people would steal and covet and commit adultery and idolatry, God would show God's heart of mercy and forgiveness through the service and works of the priests and through the shedding of the blood of bulls and goats. This is what the Hebrew writer is explaining. But now here's the thing, my sisters and brothers. The writer of Hebrews implies that Jesus was a different kind of priest. 
Jesus had not sinned, as we've said. Jesus was already one with God. Jesus did not have to cover up for his own stuff because he didn't have any stuff to cover up. Jesus was guiltless. Jesus was pure. Jesus was the great high priest, and he became the sacrifice himself. He became the substitutionary offering himself. He became the target himself. He became the one who would die for us himself, for you and for me. This is why he is the greatest of all servants. And it would be this one who would, through his own pain and suffering, through his own blood, would make things right which had been wrong, forever making them right for all of those who would believe and obey. This is why Jesus is greater than any prophet. This is why Jesus is greater than any preacher. This is why Jesus is greater than any philosopher. He took upon our sins and paid the price himself so that forever and ever and ever, we won't ever have to fear God turning on us. Oh, that's good news, sisters and brothers. That's a, you just missed your shout right there. In fact, the author of Hebrews writes that because of these unique aspects of his service, Jesus was always the greatest of all. Even before he showed up in the manger, he was the greatest of all. So in order to make this point with the Jews who were familiar with the stories in Genesis, the writer makes this obscure reference as we begin to close to a priest of Yahweh named Melchizedek. It's an obscure reference. He's mentioned in the book of Genesis. The writer of Hebrew uses him as a figure because he knows that the readers are familiar with him. And he's briefly mentioned in Genesis. And the writer explains that this priest with a strange name was a prefigure of Christ, according to verse six. Christ, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is this strange figure who seems to just show up from out of nowhere. We don't know his backstory. We don't know who his mama and them was. We don't know who he, where he came from. He lived centuries before Aaron, Moses, and all of the others who would serve as priests. But he is revered, revered rather, as God's anointed priest. So in referencing Jesus, once again, the rite of Hebrews alludes to Melchizedek, a priest of God who shows up out of the blue long before Aaron had established or God had established the priesthood through Aaron. Jesus shows up on the radar of history seemingly out of nowhere. Yeah, there had been prophecies that he would come, but he just shows up, comes down 40 and two generations. And there he is, the one who is for us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian who died in a prison camp after plotting to kill Hitler. Now he was really taking justice serious, but he shines some light for us here. Bonhoeffer said that Jesus since before time is Christ pro me or Christ pro us, meaning that he is the person for us. He is the being for us. Christ is pro me. Christ is pro you. Christ is for us. Christ is for us like no one else. This is the way in which he exists. Before he came into the world, this is the way he existed. So listen, listen, if no one else is in your corner, Christ is. If no one else seems concerned about your well-being, Christ is. Because he is appointed to be pro-us, pro-me, and pro-you. There are a lot of folks who are anti-you. There are a lot of folks who are anti-us. Sometimes you are anti-you. Sometimes I am anti-me. But even then, Jesus is pro-you, is for you, for us. And as we look at what happened on the cross, it just makes clear to the entire universe how God and Jesus have always been for us. He is our mediator. He is our high priest who walked the dusty streets of Palestine, came down 42 generations to be the ultimate mediator. He came as once and for all the high priest forever, not as one who would have to sacrifice bulls and goats century after century forever and ever to appease the righteousness and justice of God. Oh, I praise God 
for Jesus being our high priest. He has served like nobody else. You say, preacher, now you need to sit down, but tell me what should be our response. Well, it's stewardship month, isn't it? Now that we know that Jesus is the high priest and he served us in this way, the right of Hebrews remind the, reminded the other Hebrews that this was the work of Jesus and it was the greatest work, the greatest act of service ever. How are we to respond? We are to respond by worshiping God through giving our gifts, through giving our service, through giving our time, talent, talent and treasure for the benefit of the kingdom. And when we do that, we're operating like, like Jesus, the ultimate high priest. We have to give, we have to sacrifice, we have to yield, we have to turn all that we have over to God so that God can blow on it, so that God can bless it, so that God can anoint it. But that's how we're to respond, out of gratitude in worship and praise. The story is told, and you might have heard it. There was an older gentleman, Deacon Jim. He was serving in a Presbyterian or an Episcopal church. And whenever worship would reach a certain level, even in this Presbyterian or Episcopal church, whenever he would hear just the right song, Deacon Jim would get up and start shouting, worshiping God like there was no tomorrow. He was a tithe of the church. He gave a whole lot to the church community and the neighborhood community. But whenever a certain song would be sung, the Deacon Jim would run around that church and shout and they would have to hold Deacon Jim down. They would have to try to get him to calm down. And so the leaders of the church said, listen, uh, we've got to change this scenario because Deacon Jim doesn't seem to know we aren't those kind of people anymore. That's not the way we worship God. We use some kind of restraint, strength. We use some kind of dignity and, and we employ dignity as we worship God. So why don't we go and talk to Deacon Jim at home? So they made a trip to Deacon Jim's farm. Deacon Jim was working on that farm, plowing the land. He had his mule there. He had his, he had his instrument of farming there, his plow right there. He was plowing the land. And the elders walked up to Deacon Jim and they said, Deacon Jim, uh, do you know why we're here? And he said, yeah, I could see you coming down the road. I know why you're here. You want me to stop praising God the way I do. You want me to stop worshiping at the level that I do. You want me to stop running around and shouting the way I do. Well, listen, let me tell you something. As you were driving up the road, did you see all those acres? That's what the Lord, who is my high priest, gave me. So I've got to praise him like that. My, my, my children, one of whom still lives with me, they haven't brought me any trouble my entire life. I never had to get them out of jail. So I've got to pray my, uh, praise my high priest for all that he's given to me. And listen, if you don't like my shouting, and they said, no, we don't. We might have to kick you out of the church. He said, well, listen, if that is my prospect, if that what lies in front of me, I want you to do one thing. I want you to hold my mule, hold the reins of my mule, because what I'm about to do right now is do the same thing I do in church at home. I'm going to give my high priest, priest praise and I'm going to shout and pray hallelujah to it. So hold my mule. Hold my mule. Sisters and brothers, that is our application. The high priest has done it all. But we are now to praise him with all that we have. With our giving our singing, our loving, and our service. In Jesus' name, yeah. amen. Yeah. Sisters and brothers, maybe there is one here today. You have not yet made a commitment to Jesus as the Lord of your life. You haven't made a decision to follow the Lord. Jesus can make your life brand new. He will come inside of you through his Holy Spirit and give you a love that passes human comprehension. And then you'll be charged to share that love with others. If you are one, you've never received Jesus as Lord, or if you just want to recommit your life to Christ, or if you just need a church home, 
we invite you to call 313-537-2590. Get in contact with our elders. Get in contact with me and tell us what you desire. Is it salvation? You need to be baptized? Is it just to reaffirm your faith or do you need a church home like Calvary Presbyterian Church of Detroit? Won't you call? Or if you're in the sanctuary and this describes you, why don't you come forward, give me your hand and guide your heart? Won't you come? We invite you to come. <laughs>